Good morning. We have uh, a few, or one announcement actually this morning. Um, today we will celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper. All communicant members, guests who have an attestation from a sister church, and guests who have been admitted by the elders are welcome to partake. If you are a visitor and you would like to join us in the celebration, the ushers can direct you to the elders for a short meeting. They will also be available immediately following the service to speak with you about attending the Lord's Supper in the future. Um, and today, this morning, we have our regularly scheduled uh, minister for the morning, and we are very thankful that he is here. And, and uh, Reverend in Hollander. Uh, Good morning. Yes, I am still here, and that means the baby is not. Out of reverence for the Lord, let's begin our worship together while standing. Our call to worship is from Psalm 122. Psalm 122 is, it ends with the prayer for the peace of Jerusalem. This is how the psalm opens, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. This is how we also enter upon the presence of the Lord, being glad in our hearts that we have this opportunity for worship. Congregation, from where does your help come? Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Amen. Receive also his greeting, grace mercy and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's also respond to this greeting of our God by singing His praise with the words of Psalm 117, the only stanza. This morning we again may listen together to the reading of God's holy law, as we heard in the announcement prior to the service. This afternoon, the Lord willing, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 teaches us that we ought to examine ourselves before eating and drinking of the body and blood of the Lord. And part of our self-examination would also involve submitting our lives to the scrutiny of God's holy law. So it's fitting for us to be able to do that this morning again together as congregation before we celebrate this afternoon. After we've listened to God's law, we'll sing together from Psalm 34, the stanzas 3 and 5. This morning, I'll read God's law with you in Deuteronomy chapter 5. This is the Word of God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male servant or your female servant, or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, and you shall not commit adultery, and you shall not steal. And you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. And so when our Lord Jesus Christ was asked which of these was the great commandment in the law, he replied with this summary, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so the Apostle Paul also concludes in Romans 13 that love is the fulfilling of the law. also come to God in prayer as we ask for His blessing in the opening of His Word this morning. Our Father in heaven, we are indeed glad that we may be together in Your presence again on the morning of this day. 
So many years ago, as your people ascended Jerusalem together as, as people of God, they spoke to one another about their gladness, how good it was to be able to, to stand foot in your holy place, to be there even in the gates of the city with so many people gathered for the various festivals which you commanded in your word. We thank you that even today, as we gather together as congregation, we may do that in a, in a special way, perhaps not in the, in the doorway of the temple or in the temple courts, but as we know from your word and as we may hear again this morning in a far greater way, being the temple of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we may be here together experiencing the power of your spirit in our midst that we may be the dwelling place of your Spirit. It's a marvel for us because we know that we certainly don't deserve that. We have not earned it in any way. Like the psalmists in the psalms before this, our call to worship, those opening psalms of the songs of ascent, the people also recognize a brokenness, a discord, a lack of peace, an oppression and a tension, and all these as the fruit of sin. Sin in this world, which causes this world to be broken and groaning. It's not the way that you made it in the beginning. We know that you looked at it all and saw that it was very good. A very good creation that had unlimited potential to become even more beautiful. That the people would fill the world, have dominion over it. But how all that changed in a moment. And today, too, we still struggle with our actual sins, even as we know we are already guilty because of our original sin. Yes, Father, we recognize that to be here together as congregation, experiencing the power of Your Spirit and knowing the presence of Your Spirit is all of grace. You comforted us in that gospel message last week that we are indeed saved by grace alone. That though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you make us alive in Jesus Christ. It's our prayer that you would continue that work also this morning as we open your word together. That the immeasurable riches of your kindness toward us in Christ Jesus would pour out on us again this morning. That the gospel message of your grace would be impressed upon our hearts. Father, use our worship this morning also to prepare us for this afternoon when we may look forward to celebrating the Lord's Supper together. You have called us to examine ourselves. We have submitted our lives to the scrutiny of Your law, and we know that we fall short of ourselves. We also know a Savior whose righteousness is ours through faith in Jesus Christ. Bring that Savior home to us again through Your Word. Indeed, Father, it's a gospel message that most of us this morning know well, and yet we recognize how much we need that Word to be preached to us week in and week out, and so we're grateful for this day of rest, that after all the turmoil and all the groaning of this past week, we may again find rest in You. You know all that we have come into this building with on our hearts and minds, whether that pertains to our own circumstances or the circumstances of our loved ones, our family and friends, so many things that weigh upon us, Father. And so we hear, we sit here longing for rest. Also those who may be participating via the live stream this morning who are unable to be here with us in our midst and yet blessed by technology to receive this word, give them also that rest in their heart and mind. A rest which we know is to be found only in Christ, our Savior, who has called us to come to Him, to take His yoke, which is easy, and His burden, which is light, that we may find rest for our souls. Give us that rest as we open Your Word together. We pray it in Jesus' name alone. Amen. This morning we can 
keep working our way through the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. So before we turn to our text, I'd like to read a psalm, Psalm 133. It's on the liturgy for this afternoon as well as one of the psalms to be sung, which ties this morning and this afternoon also together in a beautiful way. Psalm 133 is known as the psalm which gives expression to the blessing of harmony and unity among God's people, and we're going to hear that also in Ephesians chapter 2. After we've read that psalm, we'll go to Ephesians 2 and read what we looked at last week by way of reminder. Psalm 133 then, a song of ascents of David. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. A short and yet a very impactful psalm. Let's also read Ephesians 2. Last week we looked at the verses 1 through 10. We'll read those verses once more since our text this morning, as we'll hear, flows directly from that. Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10. This is what we heard last week. This is the Word of God. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's the selected Scripture readings. In preparation for the message, we'll also sing together from Psalm 85. The psalmist says in the opening lines there, Let me now hear what God the Lord will speak. For to his saints, to him in worship seek, he will proclaim his peace and righteousness. This is our prayer that God would also let us hear what he has to speak to us this morning.
This morning, we'll look at Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 22. Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 22 is the text. This is how the letter continues then. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that He might create in Himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And He came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through Him we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus Himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So far our text, <clears throat> excuse me. In response, we'll sing from hymn 52, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. We just read of that, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. Hymn, 20, or sorry, hymn 52, we'll sing the stanzas 1, 3, and 4. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, give peace a chance. A number of you this morning might recognize that as the title of a John Lennon song from 1969. That's way before my time. Give peace a chance. It's described as an anti-war song. It became the anthem, if you will, of the anti-war movement in the 1970s. It's a cry for world peace. It made it all the way up to number two on the British singles charts. And that says something about our world's understanding of peace. Now, peace is a word that comes back a number of times in our Scripture text this morning. It can be said right off the bat that it's a far different kind of peace. If this peace is to have a chance... It's going to demand a turning to Jesus Christ, a grabbing hold of Him in faith. Therefore, the word comes at the beginning of our text. Perhaps you remember the question you're supposed to ask when you see the word, therefore. What's it, therefore? It's a direct connection between what we heard last week and what we get to hear this week. Verses 1 through 10 and 11 to 22 are closely related. They're not just closely related in content, they're also closely related in their structure, in their pattern. There's a you were and now you are structure. Last week it was you were dead, but God made us alive with Christ. And today it's, you were far off, you are brought near, near to enjoy peace. Give this peace a chance. Peace with God, peace with one another, Paul is saying. 
All and only in the cross shed blood of Christ. That's the gospel message for this morning. The cross shed blood of Christ makes peace. First of all, this peace is absent. Then we get to hear how peace is secured. And third, how peace is expressed. The cross shed blood of Christ makes peace. First of all, peace absent. Therefore, remember. That's the main verb in this opening section of our text. Remember. It's the second word in our text. It's the first imperative. The first command in this opening part of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Remember. Now, remember what? Well, remember the past. Remember the past, Paul is saying. Perhaps that would raise our eyebrows a little. After all, this very same, the Apostle Paul has famous words in his letter to the Philippians, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Forgetting what lies behind. But here he says, remember what lies behind. Now, that's not a contradiction. When Paul says he forgets what lies behind, it doesn't mean he blots out his memory of the past. More, he refuses to park there. He doesn't dwell on the past. He doesn't dwell in the past. It doesn't mean he ignores it. That's why he can say here in our text, remember. Don't ignore the past because it's critical for understanding the present and the future. Knowing the past can fill us with greater appreciation for what we have today and what we can look forward to. That's a more general truth for today, too. History is too often met with a turned-up lip or a scowl. But it's important to remember the past, lest we forget, we said this past Friday, Remembrance Day. So Paul says, remember... That at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands. Now if you have your Bible open in front of you, and I would always encourage you to have your Bible open in front of you, you would notice in verse 11 that the uncircumcision in verse 11 there is, is in quotation marks. It's a label. Now, what's the apostle referring to by putting it in quotation marks? Why did the translators decide to put it that way? Well, think back to the days of the judges, for example. The days of the judges. The boys and girls here this morning probably remember the story of Samson very well. Those are great stories, memorable stories of the lion, the jawbone, Delilah, how Samson doesn't seem to clue in even though she keeps nagging at him for the same question. Now, Samson was a judge when the Philistines were oppressing Israel. When Samson falls for one of their girls, his mom and dad say to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go to take a wife from, hear it, the uncircumcised Philistines? Judges 14 verse 3. That's not just saying something about their bodies. It's way more. We might call it a derogatory term. It shows contempt. It shows scorn for those Philistines. And it comes back again in the days of Saul and of David. And and Jeremiah adds to the number of nations. It's not just the Philistines. It's not just because they're physically different that they're called the uncircumcised. To be called the uncircumcision, as Paul puts it in quotation marks, is almost a slur. Maybe we would compare it to the days of apartheid or the slave trade. White supremacy, that still exists actually. Then there's this real hatred for non-whites. There's this cultural chasm between the two. Paul is talking about a deep divide. Gentiles in every other nation besides Israel, they are the uncircumcision. 
It was built into God's law that there should be a clear and distinct separation between them. It's not to ignore that some Gentiles were graciously being part of God's people. Just think of Rahab and think of Ruth. But overall, the apostle is reminding them of a real separation. That's what he goes on to say. Remember that at one time, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise. You can hear how emphatic he is on this point. He comes at it three times, separated, alienated, strangers. Separated from Christ because Christ is a Jew, the promised Messiah to the people of God. Alienated, he says, from the commonwealth of Israel. That is, from her citizenship, from her way of life. They were not a part of this people of God, that nation that God had chosen out of all the nations of the earth to set His love on them. They're strangers to the covenants of promise, Paul says, that highlights that special position of Israel. They are the descendants of Abraham, Abraham with whom God said, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you. God didn't say that to any other nation. He didn't enter into that kind of relationship with any of those nations. He didn't pledge to be God to them. The divide couldn't be greater. In verse 14, Paul even goes so far as to speak of this dividing wall of hostility. Notice the use of the word wall. Wall. Maybe in Paul's mind's eye, He's partly thinking of that temple in Jerusalem. Then there was a wall around the court of the Gentiles. It had been there for years, decades, centuries. It wasn't a particularly high wall, mind you, about three cubits, but it was a wall. And it said, you can come here, but no further. No access beyond this point. No trespassing. It's like the signs in the stores that say, employees only, Israelites only. A big white white limestone slab was discovered in 1871 from this wall. It says on that white limestone slab, no foreigner may enter within the barrier and enclosure around the temple. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death. Paul could relate. Only about three years before he writes this letter, he's in Jerusalem and he's just about killed by an angry mob. They thought that he'd taken a Gentile into the courts of the temple. You can read about it in Acts 21. Now, ironically, in connection with this letter, the man he had taken into the temple was Trophimus, and he was an Ephesian. Well, he didn't take him into the temple, but they thought he took him into the temple. Now, maybe most of these saints in Ephesus had never actually gone to Jerusalem and seen that wall, but Trophimus may very well have taken the news back to Ephesus. Either way, the point is they know of a wall, more metaphysical than physical, a dividing wall of hostility. And that's not overstating the case when he uses the word hostility. Here's how one commentator lets us feel that hostility. Some snippets. I quote, the Gentiles, said the Jews, were created by God to be fuel for the fires of hell. It's about all the Gentiles were good for, according to the Jews. Or another quote, It was not even lawful to render help to a Gentile mother in her hour of sorest need, for that would simply be to bring another Gentile into the world. Or how about this one? 
If a Jewish boy married a Gentile girl, or if a Jewish girl married a Gentile boy, the funeral of that Jewish boy or girl was carried out. Because such contact with a Gentile was the equivalent of death. Remember that, says Paul. You were Christless, stateless, friendless, and a result, as a result, end of verse 12. You were without hope and without God in this world. Without hope and without God. That's life outside of Christ, in other words. Away from the promises of God, hopeless and godless. That's a fair assessment even of our world today, isn't it? To be outside of Christ is to be hopeless. Isn't there a lot of hopelessness? At the ARPA presentation this past week, we heard some examples of that. The expansion of euthanasia, for example, is a sign of that. There's this increasing hopelessness. People have little to live for. Paul says that was all the Gentiles. What do you think? Can you sitting here this morning relate to that? I think it's probably fair to say that we run into a similar question as we did last week. Paul talks last week about being dead. You were dead. When all we know is life in Christ, being raised in the church and enjoying this constant growth through life in the church, then this contrast might fall a little bit flat. From death to life... But today's too, we are these Gentiles, we cannot forget that, the uncircumcision that Paul talks about. Not one of us here this morning is a Jew by descent. Not one of us can trace our bloodlines to Abraham, I dare say. Remember, says Paul, that at one time you were Christless, stateless, friendless, hopeless, godless. Yes, beloved, He is in that way addressing us too. There was a a blocking wall that said, you don't belong. Jews only. Now, past Friday was Remembrance Day, and then Jews only has a very different ring to it. And yet, maybe not entirely, because it has at its roots the same hatred The same contempt that Paul is talking about. It wasn't just Jews that had contempt for the Gentiles, also the other way around, and that still exists, sadly. Anti-Semitism is as alive as ever. In other walls, too, people still build walls. Physical walls, like at one time the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain, and if you don't know what those are, Google them when you get home, because we don't have time to talk about them this morning. But it's not just those physical walls. They're walls between races, walls between nations, walls between cultures, and people do horrid things to each other as a result. Remember all of that, says Paul. The wall between Jews and Gentiles. Why remember that? Not to park there, to dwell in the past but to gain full appreciation and amazement even for the present. Verse 13, but now, but now, that's the same kind of strong contrast as we had last week in verse 4, but God, but God being rich in mercy, we heard last week, here it is again. The unexpected, the inexplicable, the incredible. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Far off, brought near. And verse 14 
He has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Christ breaks down walls. Peace is absent when walls exist. That's not only true in this big picture, is it? We can be left thinking small picture too about the walls that still exist in the church even. Why is there still division? Why hostility? Why barriers? Where are we putting up fences? Why are we putting up fences? Even as we anticipate celebrating the Lord's Supper this afternoon, we examine ourselves. Does what Christ does on this macro scale, the big picture, also work itself out in the micro scale, the smaller picture? Because our text says it clearly, dividing walls, they come down where Christ secures peace. That's our second point. How would you define peace? Some are quick to say, well, it's the absence of war or other hostilities. Or maybe peace is just a sense of quiet. How does the Apostle Paul define peace here? Peace for Paul isn't a concept or an idea. Peace is a person. Verse 14. For he himself is our peace. How is that possible? It's in breaking down this wall. And how did he do that? Well, verse 15, Paul says, By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. We have to pause there for a minute because you might remember that Jesus says in Matthew 5 or 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish them. And now Paul says, he, here, he is our peace by abolishing them. So did he abolish them or didn't he? It's a problem of translation. Paul doesn't use the same word as Jesus. Even if in English it's the same word. The NIV, as a result, translates it this way, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. Setting aside, not abolishing them. We might even say that Paul isn't making a comment on the abolishing part of Matthew 5 or 17, but on the fulfillment part of that text. When Jesus fulfilled the law, He set it aside. Not that it's not necessary anymore or or useful at all anymore. Far from it. Paul will write elsewhere that it's still important to keep the law by faith. And there he's thinking especially about the Ten Commandments. They're the laws that we find repeated in the New Testament. That's why we still listen to them today as we did earlier. But it was especially the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law that separated the Jews from the Gentiles. Sacrifices and ceremonies that pointed to the work that Jesus was to come and do. Those laws were set aside. They're nullified. They no longer operate the same as they did because Jesus has come. And in his flesh, verse 14, he breaks down those walls. Not just his flesh generally, but especially his flesh on the cross, verse 16. Let's think about that. Unpack that. Do you recall what happened in the temple the moment Jesus died? Then the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That symbol of separation between holy God and sinful people was shredded. For millennia, it hung there and said, barred, no trespassing. 
But in Jesus' death, we have full access to the Father. That curtain was torn. But it wasn't the only separating thing that was destroyed, says Paul here. Not just that curtain, also the wall. Oh, that physical wall was still standing there in the temple courts, as we heard earlier. It won't be destroyed for another 40 years or so, 70 A.D. The sign in the temple was still standing when Jesus died on the cross, but the reality of that, that wall was gone. The vertical opened through the torn curtain. And as a result, the horizontal is open over the crumbled wall. Love and peace, they always flow that way in the salvation of God. It's pictured in Psalm 133, that's why we read it together. The oil that flows down on Aaron's beard, it spreads onto his robes. The dew that falls on the slopes descends down the mountain. You see, in the cross... The curtain is torn and the dividing wall of hostility is broken down. Why? Because sin has been dealt with. It's finished. That separating sin has been paid for in Jesus' cross shed blood. And what comes out of that? The two become one, says Paul. It's almost marriage-like language. That's the mystery of this work of Jesus. It's no longer two, Jew and Gentile, but the two become one in Jesus, in His crucified body, zero degrees of separation. He is peace, and that's how He makes peace. It's not only to bring those two together, it's also to bring the two together with God, verse 16. And he might reconcile both to God in one body, thereby killing the hostility. It's a graphic choice of words, killing the hostility. It's put to death, never to rear its ugly head again, right? Oh, sadly, remnants remain like so much else in the Christian life. Division, strife. But here is hope. The victory is sure in Christ. Again, it's not of works like we heard last week. Peace is in the finished work of Christ. Peace that brings reconciliation. That means there's a new and right relationship together and with God again. In that new and right relationship with God in Christ, there is this unity with each other. The same for the Jew as for the Gentile. It's not one way for the Jew, another for the Gentile. There aren't multiple paths to God, multiple paths to a relationship with God. And flowing out of that, there aren't multiple ways to experience and enjoy unity amongst each other either. Now, Our society doesn't like to hear that. But the gospel is that exclusive. There is only one way to reconciliation. Vertically and horizontally. That's through the cross. Through the one man sacrificed on the cross, Jesus. Verse 18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Not through Him as one option among many, but through Him and only through Him. And if his readers have maybe already forgotten why that's such a blessing, Paul in verse 17 gives them a gentle reminder. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. If you think about Jesus' ministry on earth, we don't hear him preaching a whole lot about peace. But it's what he commissioned his disciples to do after his resurrection. He says, my peace I give to you. Go out and preach this gospel of peace in my flesh. Preach it to those who were far off and those who were near. Remember? 
That was the first command at the beginning of our text. Remember. That way you don't forget the evidence of this grace. Remember you were far off. Feel the movement, Paul is saying. You were far off. Jews, they were near. They had the gospel promises. We were far off. But this is the precious preaching of peace we hear. In Jesus, all Jew and Gentile, far off or near, are given access to the Father. And in that access to the Father, enjoy a profound relationship of peace with each other. Because Christ is our peace. And Christians are in Him. And then their peace in Him is also expressed. Our third point. We could summarize the last part of our text with three words. Three images that Paul uses to describe this, this peace that's expressed. Political, domestic, and spiritual. Have a look, verse 19. Political, domestic, spiritual. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. That's political. And members of the household of God, domestic, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, etc., speaking about the dwelling place for God. That's spiritual. Think about the political image. He's living in the Roman Empire. Paul is at pretty close to its height of its power. To hold Roman citizenship is to hold a privileged status. Paul plays that card at times in the book of Acts when he's being persecuted. He holds Roman citizenship. But even as he does that, he knows a better one. This one. It's a citizenship in the kingdom of God, as he says elsewhere. That was the theme of the ARPA presentation this past week. How our heavenly citizenship comes to bear on our Canadian citizenship. We're living in troubling times. Things are decaying at a breathtaking pace, it seems. But we are fellow citizens with the saints of a far more glorious kingdom. There is hope and confidence to be found there and motivation to keep on serving in this earth. Resting sure in the kingship of God and of Christ. That gives us a sure footing. It's why he says we're no longer strangers and aliens. They have no sense of home, no sense of place. They're always wrestling with where they belong. We know where we belong. In Christ. We're part of His society. And not just His society, Paul says, also His household. Members of the household of God. End of verse 19. See, being part of the church is far more than a place. The church isn't really a place. It's not this building. It's a people. Oh, a people living in a certain place, gathered in a certain place, but the household is about the people. Members, Paul says, of the household. Now, he's already written earlier in this letter about adoption and about the father, and he's going to write soon about the fatherhood. But here his emphasis in our text is a bit of a different emphasis. It's about the relationship between the members of the household. Brothers and sisters, he says, together in one family. Barriers and walls are torn down, and in place there is this family of God. That's what his flesh, what his cross accomplishes. The peace that he has secured on the cross is expressed here in the family of faith. And it is a wonder, isn't it? What a collection of people we are. We're not drawn together because we all have the same common interest in something. 
That might be if it was some Rotary Club or the Kinsman Club in town. There's something far deeper here. It's the work of Jesus through His flesh, through His cross. We can have a sense of belonging here. Walls don't have a place here. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek nor male nor a female, says Paul to the Galatians. We are all one. One family. Members of one household. And then there's image number three, the holy temple. Remember, in Ephesus was this massive temple for Artemis, one of the ancient wonders of the world. Maybe those of you who were able to come to the kickoff evening a number of months ago, they could, we can remember the picture of that temple. It was huge, splendid temple. There was also in Jerusalem the temple of Herod, another architectural masterpiece. Gentiles maybe thought of the one temple, Jews of the other, but in Christ, the holy temple is something far different, far more splendid, far more glorious. It's you, says Paul. The members of the household built on the foundation of the apostles, that is their teaching of the gospel of Jesus, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And if you've ever seen pictures of some such cornerstones used in building temples in the ancient world, they were massive, immovable. Jesus Christ is the rock-solid cornerstone, and on those footings, the whole structure is being joined together, growing to a holy temple in the Lord, a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. It's the people who are that temple. It's the people who are that dwelling place. Sometimes I hear it slip, assuming it's just a slip, that this room here is called the sanctuary. It's not. It's not a sanctuary. It's an auditorium. It's a place where you can come to hear, audio, the gospel, but you are the sanctuary. We don't go up to the house of God to worship on Sundays. We are the house of God. Worshiping. Isn't that all a far more astounding truth? God doesn't meet His people in a holy place. He lives in His people as the holy place. There is peace. There is peace. All made possible in the cross shed blood of Christ. Remember, remember, as Gentile sinners by nature, we were dead and we were far off. But now we're alive in Christ and brought near for peace. Near, not just to God, but to one another. So near. That in Christ we are one. One body, one temple, at peace. That's a peace the world won't know without Jesus. No chance. Let's pray for and work for that peace. Amen.
in our Thanksgiving and congregational prayer, we'll also remember, in particular, our brother Mike de Gelder and his family. Mike was hospitalized yesterday with what doctors have determined was a, in all likelihood, a heart attack. <clears throat> Excuse me. He had stents put in yesterday and is today doing well, still waiting for an angiogram to see what kind of damage was done, but this will impact him for the rest of his life and also especially the immediate future, as well as Tara and Lyndon at home. Let us pray for Mike and Tara and Lyndon at this time. Merciful and gracious God, we are so grateful to you that in Jesus Christ we know peace. Peace in our relationship with you. As we've also heard this morning, we particularly reflect on the peace that we may have with one another. That in Christ, the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles was torn down, that the two may become one. We know that we were, by nature, Gentile sinners, but by faith, you bring us into your family. You cause us to be a dwelling place for your spirit. Father, it grieves us, as we know it grieves you, when walls still exist, when division and strife is there in your church. And so even as we marvel with gratitude at the work of Jesus Christ in, in breaking down walls of hostility so that we might know peace, we also pray for that peace, the peace of Jerusalem, that we may experience that in all of its riches here as congregation of living light in Grimsby. That as we take this gospel message to heart of the wonder of the gospel of peace, that we may also experience it amongst one another. Give us the courage we need to apply this, to work at those relationships which are under strain. That in the confidence we have in the, the peace of Christ, we may strive for peace. You know what pains exist because of that strife and that tension and that division. Barriers that we put in place because of, of our own weakness and our own sinfulness. As we work at that, Father, may we always do that motivated by the fullness of peace that we will enjoy when Jesus returns on the clouds. Father, we are anticipating, tasting something of this wonderful peace when we celebrate at the Lord's table this afternoon. We thank you for Reverend Van Pata's willingness to administer the sacrament, to lead us in worship. You know that he also has his own frailties that limit his capabilities, and yet we are amazed that you still grant him sufficient health to bring that word so beautifully every time again. Will you give him enough strength then to lead our worship this afternoon, bring him here in safety and as we gather for worship under His leading, may it be for our peace and for a growing unity among brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for particular needs in the congregation. We just heard about our brother Mike de Gelder. He seems too young to hear news about a heart attack. And yet again, it's a reminder of how frail our flesh is. It is a very real picture that you give us in your word, that all flesh is like grass. It's here today, withers tomorrow. That's why we're so grateful that at the same time, your word also says that it's your word that remains forever. That's where we turn. That's where we have turned, and that's where we will continue to turn. And we pray for the dig elders as they work through the this experience and the overwhelming feelings that come with it, that they may, in your word, find comfort and direction and hope. We pray for Mike in the hospital and 
And for the care that he's receiving there as he awaits the angiogram, we ask that they may also be encouraged by the results of that. But if it shows that there is greater damage than first, than first hoped, give them rest in the knowledge that this was not an accident. It comes from your fatherly hand. We pray for Tara and Lyndon at home. as They also await news of, of how things go today. We pray for Tara as, her help, as his help meet, that you'll give her all the strength that she needs to be there to support him, even as she copes with her own frailties. We pray for Lyndon, their son. Father, we would have loved to see him here in our midst and pray that you would still as yet allow that. At moments like this, we become confronted with the constant presence of, of death in this world. And Father, we pray that the gospel of life will continue to motivate us to live for you each day and each and every day again. Encourage them as family uh, to look together to you. We thank you for the congregation where we may serve together, we may function together as body. We pray for our catechism teachers as they teach our youth this doctrine of salvation. Help them each week to be prepared for their lessons and to be able to engage with the youth. We pray for our youth that they will be eager to learn and to listen and to cooperate, that they may grow through this. We thank you for the various teams which function in church life to ensure that life as congregation continues to run smoothly. We thank you for the work of the accompanists as they selflessly give of their time and their talents to, to help us in our songs of praise to you. We thank you that young and old alike, male and female, boy and girl, we can all work together and that we see that happening. Each a valuable contribution to life as the whole. Stir us on to continued growth in that, Father, that the body may also continue to be a light. We are a light. And we then also must be who we are in this community. Help us, Father, to do that, even in the way that we serve together as a body at peace with one another. Hear us in Jesus' name alone. Amen. You have an opportunity to express your thankfulness to our God in the offering, which is for the work of mercy. Afterwards, we'll also sing together as our doxology, the last stanza of Psalm 106. We'll sing stanza 23.
Lift up your hearts to the Lord to receive his blessing and then go your ways in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.